And I, I want to look at some things tonight as it pertains to the power to get well. And uh, I know that, uh, especially in our circles, this is, this is a scripture uh, that, that many can quote, and obviously we should quote it and we should confess it. And, uh, but I also see something else, and, and sometimes I feel like it might be somewhat justifiable, uh, but at the same time, you know, you'll see people and, and uh, they, they want to back off from words like wealth and, and rich and abundance. And uh, I understand, you know, that, that there are people that, that can take things, if we want to say it, too far. But here's the, the issue. Not just if you have lack in your life, but that will apply. If, if, but if you have lack in your life or you want to do more for God, right, then abundance and wealth is good news because it's available, right? It's available to us. And he says some things here in Deuteronomy 8, and we talked this morning over the, over the giving, uh, over the tithe and offering, that uh, Deuteronomy, of course, is second law. It's, this is Moses going over the second time what God told them in the book of, of, of Exodus. Moses is not long on the earth at this point, and he's re going back over, and he tells the people here, let's, let's just start here in uh, verse uh, 9. Well, verse 7. And notice it says, The Lord brings you into a good land, a land of brooks, of fountains, depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein, now, now notice some of this, because what he's describing is the physical promised land, but the church has taken it and, and used it to describe heaven. It doesn't describe heaven, it describes the new creature. It describes the Holy Ghost filled life. It describes us and in our redemption. And he says, notice, he says, A land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. Without scarceness. That word scarceness, it, it means poverty. A land where you will eat without poverty. Everybody say, without poverty. Without poverty. We're going to look at this more in depth tonight. There is no provision in your covenant for poverty. Amen. You have no promise of poverty in the Word. God, right? Amen. I do have a promise of abundance and more than enough. Now, this is important. He goes on and he says, without scarceness, without poverty, you, you shall not lack anything in it. You shall not lack anything in the land. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God. Notice, you've eaten and you're full. Remember part of the problem in Haggai? He said, you've brought in much, but it turns to little. Yes, There's never enough. You come to the circumstance, and, and, and it should be this amount, but it costs you this amount. It should be uh, 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 cheap, but it costs you a lot. Yes, right? He said, you're going to eat, and you're going to be full. Bless the Lord your God for the good land that He gives you. Beware, notice, that you forget not the Lord your God in not keeping His commandments and His judgments and His statutes that I command you this day. Lest when you are eaten, you have eaten and are full and built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied right building good houses and living in them 
Herds multiplied, flocks multiplied, gold and silver multiplied. Right? Then he says, Then your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God that brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And he goes on and says he led you through the great and terrible wilderness and talks about the serpents and brought water out of, out of the rock of Flint. But he said he fed you in the wilderness with manna, verse 16, which your fathers knew not, that he might humble you and that he might prove you. For what reason? To do you good at your latter end. And you say in your heart, notice my power... And the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. So God's expecting them to get wealth. Yes, sir. Notice what he doesn't have a problem with. The wealth. What he's got a problem with is forgetting him. Forgetting him. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, doesn't have a problem with the wealth. God's the one that says, I'm going to give you the wealth. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you houses. I'm going to multiply everything you own. I'm bringing you into this land to do you good. Right? But you shall remember, notice, the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you the power to get wealth. For what purpose? That He may establish... His covenant, which He swear unto your fathers as it is this day. This is something that's so important. The covenant cannot be established if God's people aren't wealthy. See, part of the establishment of the covenant is wealth. Now, the church backed off from that for whatever reason, however long ago they did it. It took thousands of years for them to teach us wrong. Amen. Right? Amen. And, and they talked about different things. And, and you know, the money is the root of all evil. And you, you realize, oh, I'm not going to get into all that tonight. But here's the thing. When you look at what God said, not only did He say, I gave you wealth. He said, I gave you the power to get it. So that I can establish my covenant. Part of the covenant is being fully supplied with abundance. Amen. It's not an issue of are you rich or are you not rich. The issue is do you have a covenant? Because if you, are, if you have a covenant with God, part of that covenant is wealth. And it's the same covenant that we talk about that produced redemption. It's, it's the same blessing that Jesus, in Galatians 3.13, the Bible says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. And then it says this, so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith. Is that right? That's the covenant he's talking about. The covenant that he said, I want to establish as I swear unto your fathers. He swore unto Abraham that he would bless him and make his name great and that his seed would be great. We were brought into that covenant by the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the content of the covenant hasn't changed. People's thinking about the covenant hasn't changed. The enemy had to get people to quit thinking covenant and start thinking religion. He, right? M men's doctrine and men's idea had to get people to quit expecting anything from God. Amen. But he said when you get there, now watch, don't forget me. Now that's two-sided. That's a double-edged sword. Don't forget me in that I'm the one that gave this to you, but also don't forget I want you to have it. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have what you need. I want, right? 
God doesn't care if you have six cars and four houses as long as you remember Him. Remember Him. Put Him first. Hallelujah. We are done. In your life, I'm telling you, you're done struggling financially. You're finished. You're finished struggling. Why? There is too much in the covenant that we have a right to for us to struggle. Oh, glory. Amen. We've been given the power to get well. And he said it was to establish the covenant. To establish the covenant. Isn't it interesting that when you read about the people of Israel, when they had lack and insufficiency was when they were in disobedience. As long as they were in obedience, they walked in abundance and more than enough. Because they were God's covenant people. Well, we know that God hasn't changed His covenant people. We know that His His covenant people according to the flesh is Israel. But we're His covenant people according to the Spirit. We've been grafted in. What applied to them applies to us. You and I have been given the power to get well. And we've not been brought into a physical land, but we've been brought into a spiritual land of redemption and been given the power to get wealth in the spirit just like they were given the power to get wealth in the natural. Every, everything that God said to them naturally, God says to us as spiritual seed of Abraham and the spiritual seed of Abraham get the physical benefits of the natural seed of Abraham. Glory to God. Because we've been brought into the covenant. We've been brought into the covenant. You know, when my wife and I got married, we didn't just enter into a contract, we entered into a covenant. If you look at marriage as just a contract, then, then you know, you talk about her money and his money and the her money and my money and, and everything separate. When you come into a contract, everything you, into a covenant, everything you have is mine and everything I have is yours. When you entered into, when God cut a covenant with Abraham, God did not make Abraham walk through those pieces. Abraham was asleep when God was walking through those pieces and God himself walked walked through those pieces of those animals and swore promises blessing I will bless you I will make your name great I'll bless your seed Abraham had nothing to say about it God is in in effect saying Abraham everything I have is yours everything you need I will supply based on this covenant glory to God and that's the covenant we came into so when we got married Ever what I had automatically became hers. What she had automatically became mine. Because we're in covenant. We're one. You can't separate something when you're one. It can't be her money and his money when you're one. It can't be my stuff and your stuff when you're one. Are you getting this? God, God doesn't make you one with him in covenant and then hold out well we're in covenant in every area but this because you know that money's evil right listen money is amoral you understand what that means money money's not good or evil it's how you use it amen if God thought, and, 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 and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to say, if God thought it was evil, why would he give you the power to get it? Amen. Amen. People suffer needlessly when they have a covenant that God wants to establish. Will you let him? Will you let him establish that covenant in your life? Amen. When you're, where your days are filled with enough and abundance and insufficiency and lack are a thing of the past. Yeah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So he said, I've given you the power to get wealth. Well, let's look at, at, at a couple things real quick before we... 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 
I, I, I want to encourage you. You've got you've to live like what you're seeing tonight is true. You cannot exercise yourself more in the physical realm of abundance than you do in the spiritual realm. You cannot act like your ability to work is greater uh, to, to work is greater than your ability to sow. Amen. There are people that think that, that they have a greater opportunity for provision depending upon what they can do with their hands when in reality the provision should be greater from what you sow than from what you work for. Your harvest should outweigh your paycheck. My, my paycheck should eventually, I should be working to make my paycheck see. And I'm living off the harvest. See, under the curse, everything that worked for Adam without toil and sweat, begin to rebel. Right? When, when the Bible says the ground will not produce for you, that, that leads us to understand it was producing for him before. Isn't that what the Bible says? It says, it says the earth brought forth of itself. You know, Adam wasn't in the garden working and sweating and toiling and weeding. I've heard preachers say that. Well, you know, Adam had to pull weeds. There were no weeds. There was no curse. God put Adam in the garden with all sufficiency in all things abounding to everything that he needed. When he, when, he, when, he, when he sinned and he disobeyed God, the curse came and everything that produced without effort rebelled. And then the Bible said, you're going to make a living from the sweat of your brow. Well, now wait a minute. I thought that had been reversed. I thought Jesus had come and bought us back. You know what we hear? Well, you know, Jesus came and undid what Adam did. So does that mean that everything with, that came with what Adam did has been undone? That doesn't mean you don't need to work, but it means it's not your source. I've been given the power to get wealth, and the power to get wealth is not my job. Are you following me? Yeah, yeah. Whew, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. This is a familiar scripture, but let's look at it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you through His poverty might be rich. One translation says, though he was so very rich, yet he became so very poor, so that you through his poverty might be rich. Now, if you, if you just break that phrase, that sentence down, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know the grace, that though he was rich, relatively speaking to where he came, Living in a place with walls of jasper, gates of pearl, streets of gold, right? And then he comes to the earth and walks on dirt. Relatively speaking, he became poor. Jesus was not a poor man. But relative to where he came from, he became very poor. Right? But now notice, here's the thing. Whether you believe he was poor physically or not is irrelevant. Because it says, though he was rich, he became poor, so that you through his poverty. Now, now this, is, this is so important. We have the power to get wealth, and now we see this being enacted in the lives of the New Testament believer. You through his poverty yes, sir. might be rich. I heard a person say one time, well, that's, that's spiritual poverty and spiritual richness. And, you know, it just didn't set right in my spirit. This was many, 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 many years ago. And so I just started looking, and, you know, words mean what they mean. And, and in the Greek, it means physical riches and physical poverty. That's what it means. Words mean what they mean. 
Jesus became physically poor so that I, through his physical poverty, might be physically rich. Is that right? Now that's part of redemption. That's part of the New Testament covenant. That's as much a part of the covenant of redemption as salvation and healing. That's as much as the new covenant, amen, amen. as deliverance and victory. Amen. amen. You don't want to do without anything Jesus died to give you. Amen. 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 When, when people have a problem with your prosperity, they just don't understand Jesus died to give you that. I'm going to take everything he died to give me. It's not about having things as much as it is about doing everything that Jesus died to give me. Right? There's no part of salvation you don't want. There's no part of redemption that you don't want. There's no part of wholeness that you don't want. You don't want to be saved and on your way to heaven and living relatively healthy but broke. You don't want to be saved and on your way to heaven and living relatively uh, uh, comfortably financially but be sick. Is that right? You don't, you don't want to be healthy and, and have abundance but yet be plagued in your mind or issues in your family. You want all the covenant. You want it all operating in your life. The power to get wealth is not just money although it involves that. The power to get wealth is you obtaining everything that was bought and paid for you by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have the power to get it. If I don't have it, I can get it. If I don't have it, I can get it into my life. And, and we're going to show you why. But, but here's, here's the thing. You've got to live this way. I'm redeemed from poverty. I'm redeemed. It's not part of my life. Amen. When somebody calls poor boy, don't you dare answer. When somebody starts talking poverty about around you, don't you agree with them. Rich folks and poor folks talk different. Is that right? They talk different about money. They talk different about opportunities. They talk different about earning. Somebody that doesn't have nothing talks about how hard it is and what a struggle it is to make a living. Got to work. Break my back. Work my fingers to the bone. What do you get? Bony fingers. That's what you get. Amen. Rich people talk about their money working for them. Rich people talk about their investments. That Right? Amen. Yeah, but I'm not rich. Well, there's your first problem right there. You call yourself what the Bible says that you are. And if Jesus became poor to make you rich, then you are that whether you see it or not. We're very good at calling those things that be not where our health is concerned. Well, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. I know I don't feel it, but I'm healed in Jesus' name. So you got to look at your bank balance or your checking balance or whatever you're looking at or your wallet or your money, and you've got to look at it, and you've got to call yourself what Jesus died to call you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's part of redemption. And then you live that way. You live that way. You don't, you, don't, you don't live and act like you don't have what you need. Does that make sense? Because there are people that will declare, I've given, therefore it's given unto me, and then they go about their day like they haven't given, and it's not being given unto them. Right? Right? Think about this. We're going to read this scripture in a moment. If you have given, Jesus said, it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So if you have given, then why would you live like nothing's coming back? Amen. Or act like nothing's coming back? So I have a covenant. I've been given the power to get wealth. Hallelujah. Now, haha, Acts chapter 20, 
The power to get wealth, a large part of the power to get wealth is seed time and harvest. And this is so important. This is where my life changed. When I figured out that I have the ability and the power to change my financial circumstance, everything changed. Everything changed. You know, when Pastor Michelle and I got a hold of the, of the Word of God concerning finances, you know, I was raised in a healing environment. Uh, my dad was healed during the days of the Voice of Healing uh, at, at a Assembly of God Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Elsie Roby was the, the minister. Uh, Claude Bowman pastored the church. And, and Elsie Roby was a, a, a one of the ministers in the days of the Voice of Healing. And he laid hands on my dad, and my dad got healed. I mean, we knew God would heal. We saw God heal. We never, I mean, I'm not against going to the doctor. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying when I say this. I'm saying the way I was raised, we didn't go to the doctor. Dad just prayed for us, and we got healed. Amen. I mean, I've seen it over and over and over again. Now, I go to the doctor, and I take my child to the doctor. I'm not against doctors, okay? But what I'm trying to explain to you is, so that was something that we talked about all the time. But, boy, we struggled financially. Struggle. I mean, God would bless us, and we live from miracle to miracle. This is no knock against my parents or against what they believe, but that, that was how it was. We live from miracle to miracle. God will come through somehow. You just hold on. Right? God will show up, but you got to hold on. Amen. And so when, 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 when I got a hold of the Word, and Pastor Michelle and I got a hold of the Word, you know, uh, she had been delivered and, and set free, and God had done so many wonderful things for her. But we're broke. I, I don't mean just struggling. We're broke. Amen. Some, sometime I'd like to set up a tour and take people where we lived and, and what we drove. We can't no more. It's, it was all junk. When we got married, Pastor Michelle was driving an old Chrysler Fifth Avenue. Oh, old Chrysler Fifth Avenue, the, the, the square kind. I don't know if y'all remember it. But, but, you know, I mean, it was a, it, at one time, many hundreds of thousands of miles before, it had been a decent car. But here's the thing. It was stolen. No, not somebody stole it from her. It was stolen, and she bought it and knew it was stolen. This is before Christ. The car had no title. The serial numbers had been removed. Amen. We 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 lived in old. We lived in Goodlesville, uh, not Goodlesville, uh, uh, Old Hickory, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. And I was driving a a, a Volkswagen Rabbit. That had seen its better days because I'd bought it with my tax return from an old guy that really stuck it to me, but I needed a car. He acted like he was doing me a favor. He was not doing me a favor, but I needed a car. I was driving the church van to work. Church bus, actually, it's a bus. <laughs> it's a miracle Pastor Michelle fell in love with me because I had nothing going on. Zero. I just want you to know. <laughs> Amen. I'm driving the church bus to work. Hallelujah. I could have given everybody a ride, but I didn't have anything. We had nothing. I'd lost everything. She had lost everything. When, when we got married, when we got married and went to get a checking account, you know, we was going to get a joint checking account, they pulled my credit, and God is my witness, they laughed. I had lost everything. I had filed bankruptcy at a, at a very young age. And for years, for, for years, they, it was just that way. Amen. We didn't have anything. Nothing. Our house was furnished with early goodwill. Now, I'm telling you all this for a reason. But, there, man, there came a time when I saw something in the Word. Amen. I, I begin to see something about the seed. 
and I figured something out. If I can sow a seed, a seed will produce. Now that sounds simple. But I figured out, I got to live by the seed. Because I'm not wise enough to fix all this on my own. And, and Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, notice what Paul said. I've showed you all things, how so laboring you ought to support the weak. And remember the Lord, words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. The power to get wealth is seed time and harvest. Why is it more blessed to give than to receive? Because the receiving is in the giving. If you don't give, you can't receive. If you don't sow, you can't reap. The harvest is in the seed. When you sow a natural seed, the harvest you're looking for is in that seed. You don't have to go somewhere else and get it. The receiving is in the giving. And when people and ministers and other people, they make light of giving and they say, well, we don't talk about finances. You're robbing people of their ability to harvest. When I figured out that the harvest was in the seed, my days of poverty were over. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in six months. It didn't happen uh, in a year. But it was over. Because I had the ability to sow a seed. And I figured out if I can sow a seed, there's nothing I can't sow my way out of or sow my way into. Because by, by virtue of the scriptures. Right? Let's, let's, let's look at some of them. 2 Corinthians 9. See, without giving there can be no receiving. Hallelujah. Well, what do you do when people disagree with you? Nothing. I just keep giving and keep on receiving. Amen. I keep sowing and keep reaping. Amen. I can't help what somebody else believes, but I'm like the Apostle Peter. Listen, you, you do whatever you want to do, but I can, I can only tell you and do those things that I know work. Amen. Amen. And so he says here, notice in 2 Corinthians 9, and let's look at verse 6. We'll read a couple verses here. But notice he says, This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now here's what I want you to do. We, we see this word sparingly and bountifully. Now we're not changing the scripture, but I just want you to see something. Notice the emphasis here. Take those words out and look at this. This I say, he which soweth shall reap. Is that what it would say? Sparingly and bountifully, right, they're there to tell us something. You're going to reap, and if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. But here's the bottom line of it. Sow, and you'll reap. See, this is, this is foolproof. This is guaranteed. This won't fail. Because it's a biblical principle that has a covenant of blood back of it. The covenant that you've been brought into guarantees this. Because that's the power to get wealth. So when you sow, it's not a donation, it's a sowing. It's a giving with a mind to receiving. I've had people say, well, I just give and I never think about receiving. That, that's why they don't receive. Well, I just don't think about money that much. Well, now that's a lie. Because you think about money every time your bills come due. You think about money every time you got to put fuel in your car. You think about money every time you go to the grocery store. You got to check and see if there's enough there to cover what you need to do. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. You got to be a good steward over what you have. I'm not, I'm not saying you lie. I'm saying people that say that, well, I don't care about money. That's a lie. Everybody cares about money. There are people that put an overemphasis on it, but everybody needs it and everybody desires it. Amen. Amen. But notice what he said. He that sows will reap. 
Well, what do you sow? Seed. What do you reap? Harvest on the seed you sowed. Isn't it amazing that God gave us the ability of seed time and harvest and the ability to call our seed what we need it to be and the harvest will be what we need? Yes, sir. Amen. If you're believing to come out of debt, understand that you're not believing to come out of debt until you sow a seed towards your freedom from debt. Because debt it involves physical finance. So it will require physical finance to bring me out of debt and favor, right? How quick can it happen? God brought me out of $210,000 worth of debt in nine months. Nine months. From the time we started, we sowed our seed and made our declaration, nine months later we were debt free, owed no man anything. I still owe no man anything except my house note right now. Amen. Nothing. And, and that has been since, uh, well, that's been uh, 12 years ago. God brought us out of debt. Now, people say, how'd that happen? We sowed and we declared, but we didn't just declare. You can't just pull out the confession list, I'm out of debt, needs a man, have plenty more to put in store, I owe no man anything. You need to say that, but you need to back it up with something that encapsulates your debt freedom. You sow that seed. Lord, I'm sowing this seed of faith towards my freedom from debt. And because it's your will that I have the power to get wealth. Amen. And, and Lord, to operate in that wealth, I need to be free from this debt. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? And I sow that seed. And people say, well, are you naming your seed? You call it what you want. I'm telling you, I sow a seed towards debt freedom. Because there's seed to be debt free and there's seed to stay debt free. There's faith to be debt free and faith to stay debt free. It's just like with your physical healing. You have faith to get healed, but then you've got to use your faith to stay healed. So you have faith to come out of debt, then you've got to use your faith to stay out of debt. What do you attach your faith to? Your seed. It, you know the interesting thing about the seed is it will produce perpetually. Yes, sir. Everything that God gave man in the beginning was designed to produce perpetually. And everything that God gave man in the natural in the beginning in, is, is a type of what we have received, the, the ability we have received in the spirit being brought into the new covenant. And when you sow a seed, if you won't stop the miracle action, it'll just keep producing. Amen. We're operating in things financially right now that we sowed seed for 10 years ago. Because you sow it and you never stop it. Mmm. <laughs> this is good. I'm, 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 the Lord's good to us. Now notice he says, he, he talks about verse 7, every man according to his purposes in his heart. But verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Now, what grace is that? All grace abound towards you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is able to make all of that grace abound towards you. And what will be the result? That you having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Now, now notice, notice the verbiage. All grace... And the result is you will have all sufficiency in all things and abound to every good work. There will be an abundance for every good work. Amen. Every opportunity to sow that comes up, you'll have it to sow. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Because why? You have all sufficiency. Why do you have all sufficiency? Because I've been given the power to get wealth. The power that you and I have to get wealth transcends the financial issues that the world may be facing. The, the, amen. The picture of that is in Genesis 26, and you, you know this verse. But Isaac, when the land was in a famine, the Bible says Isaac sowed in that land. And the Lord gave him a hundredfold return the same year. But there's a famine on. But Isaac's got a covenant and the power to get wealth. 
If you have the power to get wealth and you do, your seed will bring forth when there's been no rain, there's been no fertilizer, there's been nothing naturally that seems like it should happen, but you have the power to get wealth and when you sow the seed, the seed brings forth for you. The person sitting next to you at your job can go under and go bankrupt and you'll get a raise and a bonus because you have the power to get wealth. Huh. Oh my. Do you see this? Hallelujah. And then you got to live that way. You got to live like you have the power to get wealth. Quit shortchanging yourself. Amen. Well, you know, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to have that or live in that or, or whatever. Now, I'm not just talking about things. Folks, listen, there's nothing you can't sow your way into. Nothing. Now, notice. Mm. Ha, ha, ha. Notice verse 10. Now, he that ministers seed to the sower. Now, stop right there. Why don't he just give you what you need? Instead of ministering seed to you. It, I, I don't know what may be pressing on your, on, in your life. But you take the most pressing financial thing that you may have. If, if, God, if God gave you just that. And just blessed you to take care of that. That's due. So then he takes care of that. It's due next month. Right? Say your house note is pressing. You don't have the money to pay it. And God blesses you with the money to pay it. Okay, it's paid this month. What about next month? That's why he said he ministers seed. Because I can sow a seed for that house note. I can sow a seed. Am I, do you see this? And now I got seed in the ground. And every time I think about my house note, I can rejoice. Praise God, I got seed in the ground for that. Amen. Every month it's going to come up. Amen. Because God said He wants me to have goodly houses. God said He wants me to have a blessed place. He said in the dwelling of the righteous, there are treasures and riches. He said that it's furnished with all good things. Lord, I thank you that you not only want me to have a house you want it to be well furnished you want it to be well taken care of thank you that that payment is not only paid every month this house is paid in full see when you got seed in the ground you can talk that way because something's coming up and now you're decreeing a thing based on the action that you've taken Is that right? I've sown. I can decree. My house note's paid. Why? Because you'll have what you say. But you can't have what you say, Jesus said, if you're not believing, if you're not acting in faith. And part of acting in faith is sowing a seed. And it doesn't have to be something that people think is relative in, in, in number to your house note. Whatever it may be, if you only got $20 to put in the ground towards your house note, it's relative to God because of the fact that you're doing it in faith. God, God's not asking you to sow a seed of the same size as your house note. He says, I need you to put something in the ground that I can multiply. If you multiply $20 enough, it'll pay anything you got. Yes, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope I'm helping you. Because I preached myself happy a few minutes ago. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. 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 I, I was in Illinois. Uh, Illinois is a good place. I, amen. I was in Illinois where my son pastors. And, and I was up there. They were in revival. And, and I went to one night of the revival. And the next night was my grandson's, my youngest grandson. Well, no, wait a minute. My second, second grandson. Uh, his birthday. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I waited to get there to, to buy the stuff because, because I, you know, I didn't want to carry it all with me and, and all this. So I, I went shopping. And, uh, amen, I went shopping. And, and I came to the party. I came to the party. And uh, they, they, my son said, oh, Lord, 
He said, here's, here's Paul Paul. He's rich. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. All my grandkids, when I hold them for the first time, I said, boy, it's a blessing that you were born to me. You're going to like me. Amen. But, but here's my point. I'm not bragging on that so much as I'm saying. You know, it, it, when, when people say things like that, that shouldn't bother you. You're one of those rich pe- preachers. Hmm? 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 Oh, yeah. One of them rich Christians. Yeah. <laughs> There's not supposed to be any broke ones. I had a person one time tell me they were struggling and they said, I know you wouldn't understand because of all your blessings. <laughs> I mean, I understand, but I also understand this. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not wrong to be broke. It's just bad to stay that way. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I can sow and perpetually receive what I need. But eventually it gets to where it's surpassing the need and it becomes abundance. And now you're paying things out of abundance. Whereas before I was believing God just for the need. And now, as my wife says, I got that right here in my jeans. Amen. Am I helping you with this? And notice, he'll minister seed to the sower and minister bread for your food. And multiply your seed sown. And increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, now, here's the thing. He's talking about finances. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians are talking about an offering. They're talking about finances. The fruits of your righteousness. Notice that that phrase, the fruits of your righteousness, this, this whole verse 9 and 10 is what we call a parenthetical statement. In other words, it's there for clarification. All right, Paul said, "All things may abound uh, in all things, sufficient in all things. You may abound to every good work." All right. Now, if you didn't put in the parenthetical statement, and we do because it's inspired word of God, but he would just go to verse eleven, being enriched in everything. But nine and ten tell you how he's going to do it, how you're going to have all sufficiency in all things, and how you're going to be enriched to everything. How are we going to do that, Paul? Because God will minister seed to the sower. And while you're waiting on the seed to come up, he'll minister bread for your food. You may not have what you need right now, and you may think the money I have is all I have. But if you sow the seed, God will take care of you while your seed is multiplying in the ground, and you're waiting on the harvest. He's not going to let you do something by faith, and you fall apart. You're not going to lose everything while you're waiting on the seed to come up. Ooh. Well, how long will it take? Don't get over there in that. If it took you five years to get where you're at, give God six months to bring you out. Amen. Give God time because it, it'll happen. And He's multiplying the seed. Oh, glory. And He'll increase the fruits of your righteousness. What are the fruits of your righteousness? The fruits of your righteousness, now now this is so important, the fruit of your right standing with God. One of the fruit of your right standing with God is the power to get wealth. He'll increase it. Oh, that's important. Because there are people that walk around and talk about how they know they're the righteousness of God, but then they're okay being broke. Part of the fruits of your righteousness is being blessed. You know how how we talk about uh, 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 the people in the Old Testament, the the Israelites, and how they were so unbelieving, and they were this, and they were that, and they were the other? Well, you know, God told those uh, unbelieving, faithless Israelites that you'll be blessed going in, blessed coming out, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in your basket, blessed in the store. You'll be above only and not be beneath. You'll be the head and not the tail. And they weren't saved, weren't filled with the Holy Ghost. The blood of Jesus had not been shed for them. And then we read the scripture that says we've been brought into a better covenant with better promises. And yet we act like that's not God's will for us. If you know it's God's will for you, act like it's God's will for you. Dr. Summer, all you say, when you walk in somewhere, walk in on good carpet. Amen. Amen. Walk like you have what God says you have. 
Yeah, but I don't see all sufficiency in all things. Did he say it was yours? Then it's yours. Act like it's yours. Walk like it's yours. I'm not telling you to go buy something you can't afford. But you, can, you, you need to act like you are what God says you are. You need to act like you have all sufficiency in all things. And when you start acting that way, you'll quit talking that way. And when you quit talking that way, you'll quit thinking that way. And when you quit thinking that way, watch out, it's coming. Because what stops, what hinders abundance is poverty thinking. Oh, hallelujah. You know, the numbers are only going to get bigger. I was praying one time, and I said, Lord, how we, you know, I, I, I'll do everything you're telling me, but how are we going to do it? And I, I, was, I presented the numbers to God. I don't know if you do that, but I, I write them down, take them to the Lord. It's His ministry. I'm not bankrolling the thing. Right? And I took it to the Lord, and I said, now, Lord, this is what it's going to cost. And it was ever how many, several hundred thousand dollars. And you know what the Lord said to me? You have to increase. Oh, okay. I have to increase. The numbers are just going to get bigger. You know, when you go look at a place like we're looking for and believe in God for, you know, it, it, it isn't any of them thousands. It's millions. And, and you know, the people you're talking to just throw those numbers around like they're nothing. Ah, 3.8 million. It's a really good deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, you're giving me a severe discount. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. But, but, but what do you do? If, if, if you've given, and it's given to us, when we show the Ezra Project slide, that's not all we got for our building. Yeah. That's not all we got. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? We got a heavenly account. God directed us last year to take $20,000 and, and sow into our pastor's ministry and sow into what they were believing God for and, and, and call it our, our, our uh, uh, building seed. Now, I'm going to read your scripture in just a minute. Now, you do whatever you want to do with this, but that's $20,000. You take $20,000 times 100. Now, if I believe the word of God, I've got that much in my account. Amen. So why shouldn't I go talk to somebody that's asking three million for a piece of property, but yet it only looks like I have several thousand, and they're talking three million. Why wouldn't I go talk to them like I have money when I believe, if I believe I have it in my account? Well, I don't want to lead anybody on. Now, wait a minute. Do you believe you have that in your account? Then why wouldn't I talk to them like I can buy that, that property? When we hear stories about men and, men and women of God that we appreciate so much, and it seems like every time they believe for some, Dr. Summerall said this. He said one time, he said, I never had the money to do anything God asked me to do. I had to believe for all of it. I never had it. When God asked me to do it, I never had it. But yet he did it. Amen. And, and we'll hear stories like that, that they stepped out and they did this and they didn't have the money, but, but, but you know, they got the money, right? And, and we get used to those stories and we kind of become, uh, what's the word? We kind of become uh, uh, dumbed down. We kind of become numb to it. Yeah, well, we know the end result. You know, we're waiting until it gets to the end and we see the great victory. What was the key? They acted like they had the money because they believed they had the money because they did have the money because they had given and they had it in their account. Philippians 4. And, and, I'm, and I'm hurrying. Let me see my time. Okay. I want to be led here tonight. If, if I can start thinking heavenly account and not earthly account, things change. Because the figures are greater. 
Do you see that? Philip, Philip, Philippians 4, verse 17. Well, let's read verse 15. You Philippians know in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now look, it's not separate. Giving and. Now this is not English class, but you do remember what type of word and is. Is that correct? It is a conjunction. You taught school, right? Conjunction. What does a conjunction do? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? It puts two thoughts together. It joins two words. If I said, I'm coming to your house tomorrow, but that means I'm about to tell you something concerning that, that I'm coming, but it's going to be at one or two. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. The Amplified Bible says no church opened up a credit and debit account with me except you. Now that may be elementary to us, but here's the point to see. Even if you just read it in the King James, he doesn't want you just giving, he wants you receiving. He doesn't want you to just credit the account, he wants you to be able to debit the account. You have been given the power to get wealth. You've been given a heavenly debit card. Well, what's the PIN number? S-E-E-D. And you sow and you reap. Hallelujah. Do, Do you see that? Isn't it nice? Remember when you had to watch every penny? Anybody ever been there? Every penny. Hallelujah. You remember that? Isn't it nice to not have to do that? And you know it's there. Right? And you're a good steward, but you know it's there. What does that do to you when you go to get even just your basic needs? Right? Now, I'm not talking about not having good financial sense. I budget our finances, and we, we operate on a budget. But here's my point. Remember when you used to go to the grocery store? Anybody ever go to the grocery store and have to put things back? Besides me? Nobody? Boy, you all must have been born wealthy. Amen. Had to put some stuff back? You know, <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to tell this, but, but I will. People say, how broke were you? We were, we were so broke, we were on food stamps. That's why I always laugh when people say, well, you know, it's, it's, only, it's only minority groups that are on food stamps. I was big and white as you can be using food stamps. I'm not proud of that. It's just where we were. And, and, you know, we didn't have the card that they have nowadays where it could look like a debit card. We had to use the stamps. You had a blue stamp and a purple stamp and you couldn't get ice cream and, right? Oh, good Lord. Government cheese and government peanut butter. What were they trying to do to people? But here, here's my point. That's how broke we were. And I figured this out by the word of God. Wait a minute. If I can give, I can receive. Giving and receiving. Not because I desire, notice verse 17, a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So I have an account. Now, whether you want to look at it as a physical bank account or a spiritual bank account or a ledger that has your name on it. When you give, it's put down to your account. And God keeps good books. And that doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to you. Amen. Hallelujah. When when, when I give Lily her allowance, the first thing she does is she says, let's go feed the pig, Daddy. Let's go feed the pig. She's got a piggy bank in her room. Let's go feed the pig. Amen. And we, she said the other day, we got to pull it out and count how much money I have. That's her money in her account. 
We're going to pull it out and count it and go open an account. And then we're going to let her know how much you got in your account. And how much is coming to you from your account. You have an account. When you gave in the offering today, ever how much you gave was deposited in your account. Well, how much did it multiply? How much can you believe? People say, well, 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. That's not talking about money. That's talking about the return on the word. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. The sower sows the word. And then he went down to the bottom of that verse and said that the word, the word, the word, the word was sown on good ground and produced fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold, depending on the amount of thought and attention they gave to the word. When you seriously and without religious eyes really read the return that Jesus promised you, it's never less than 100 fold. Amen. And I don't argue with people about it, but they'll say, well, that's not a hundred times. But if words mean what they mean, the Greek says a hundred times. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing with you, but I can believe for that. So think about that. If you gave $10 and you times it times a hundred, what do you have? Thousand dollars. Is that right? So what do you have in your heavenly account on the ledger books? A thousand dollars. And so then you have a four hundred dollar need and the enemy's beating your mind up and you're, you're wondering where am I going to get the money? Oh my God, what am I going to do? You got a thousand dollars in your account. What do I have to do? Believe that I receive. Whew. Oh my goodness. If we don't sow, we can't reap, bountifully or sparingly. Amen. There's nothing I can't sow my way into or sow my way out of. Now, let me, let me hurry. I got just another uh, two scriptures. Look at Luke 6. Am I helping you with this tonight? You know, the, the, the Lord has us pressing into two things, two main things in, in, in our ministry. And, of course, that's we're, we're working on that building. And we're, we're working on aviation. We're working to redeem our time. Amen. Amen. That plane's going to make it so much easier. Amen. We, we, see, we haven't forgot about it. You know, we don't talk about it a lot, but we haven't forgot about it. And Pastor Michelle called me this morning and was telling me, she said, I made out a petition to the Lord. Okay, we're believing for something else now. Amen. And, 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 and told me what, what she was believing for, and of course we're in agreement. But, he, but here's the thing. You know, when, when you think about that, I had somebody ask me not too long ago, how much is the, the plane you're believing for? Well, the plane we're believing for is $350,000. But if what you sow into the ground for that is multiplied times 100, it doesn't take very much. To get that much in the account. But then I got to act like. You know, so here's where my faith is. The guy we were chartering the plane, a, a plane, the, the plane we'd been chartering, uh, he, he made a statement to me. He said, you know, when you get to the place that you can charter the plane every week, then you're ready to buy your own. Well, see, that's wisdom. But now I got a benchmark. I got a mark to believe for. People will say, well, I got all my bills right here, and look, there's just not enough. You know, it's a great thing that you know how much you owe. That's good. That shows diligence. But now just quit saying you don't have enough. What seed do you have in the ground? Take your seed and put it up against what you owe. Well, I don't know what I, what, how much I've given. There's your problem right there. If you don't know how much you've given, you don't know what's in the account. I've talked to people before and say, well, how much is in your checking account? Well, I don't know. Well, why don't you know? It's your checking account. Well, should I know? Yeah. That could be part of the problem. 
I can tell you right now, to the penny, what I have in all of my accounts. Not within $100 or $200, what I have in all of my accounts. Isn't that good, accounts? Accounts? That's good, right? That's God's will for everybody. Amen. Let me hurry. Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men will give into your bosom. For with the same measure you measure, a meat with all, it will be measured to you again. Notice, the amount that comes back is always larger than the amount given. You give, and it comes back to you in a good measure, yet pressed down, shaken together, and running over. What's the key? You got to give. I had a young couple get mad at me. I could see them get mad on the front row. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's better if you get mad to get mad in the back row. Nobody, nobody can see you, right? But, but, but they, they were sitting on the front row, and I made the statement, if you're in financial poverty tonight, the only way out is to give your way out. I saw them. I saw this. Well, right there, right there, they just shut themselves off from what God wanted. And they, they asked to meet with me, and I met with them, and they told me they were mad. And I said, well, I could tell you were mad. Well, what are you mad about? You said the only way out of financial poverty was to give our way out. It is. That's the only way. What you're doing is not work. You're working all the hours they'll give you. You're doing everything, and it's not working. So, so, so something has to change. If I want good measure, pressed down, shaken together, I have to give. I know that's simple. I know that's elementary to the core. But it changed my life. Because here's the key. You have to give, then live like you have given. Talk like you have given. Act like you have given. Amen. Going to good places, having good things, living a good life should not impress you. According to Scripture, it's expected. Jesus was comfortable with the rich and with the poor because he was meek and humble, yet expected God to supply everything he needed. Amen. I've watched my pastor interact with millionaires and I've watched him interact with people in poverty. And the, and the interaction is the same. Because the millionaire doesn't impress them and the poverty doesn't offend them. God wants to make your name great. And to make your name great He's got to change how you think about your name. So you've given, then live like you have given. If you have given, don't act like you're broke. Well, I've given. Well, don't act like you're broke. Get those words, I can't, I don't have, there's not enough. Get those out of your vocabulary. Don't talk them. Yeah, but I'm just telling the truth. No, you're not. If you believe you've given and it's given unto you and you have a heavenly account, if you're looking at what you have in your heavenly account, then to say you don't have enough is not truthful. You do because you have a heavenly account with that amount in it. Now, this, this I, I know with some of us, I'm rattling your cage tonight, and I want to. Because that's how I got to live. If, if we're going to see the things that God has promised, we got to live that way. Amen. Do, 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 do you see that? Now, haha. when we sow, we're depositing into an account. When you make a deposit, you have funds that are available for a withdrawal. You got to live that way. Now, you do whatever you want. I physically write out a, write out a, a withdrawal. Helps me. 
You can call it a petition, whatever you want. I write down the, the amount that I'm believing for. And, and, and I go before the Father. And I said, now, Father, and I, and I list my scriptures according to these verses. You said this, and you said that, and you said the other. Now, this is what I'm believing for. And I'm thanking you on, by virtue of your word that I received this in the name of Jesus. And then I sign it and date it. Fold it up, put it in my pocket, carry it in my Bible, in my notebook. Why? That's my withdrawal slip. And when the enemy starts running his mouth that you're not going to get it, I just pull out the, the slip. No, no, I've already received that. That's already done. That's in route. <laughs> See, the enemy can't get into that. If he, can, if he can't keep you thinking wrong, he can't stop the harvest from coming. He's got to keep you thinking wrong. He's got to keep you physically focused instead of heavenly account focused. Now, here's the last one. Mark chapter 10. Amen. You know, I remember when the Lord asked us to go on television. And I am a, a notoriously slow actor. And what I mean by that, now don't, don't misunderstand me, I'm very productive. But I don't hurry. When, when the Lord says something to me, I, I pray about it, I, I mull over it, I think about it. I've had people before tell me, you got to make a decision today. I said, no, I don't. Matter of fact, you can be sure I'm not going to because, because I, I, it's, it's not a good idea. But here's, so, so, right, so sometimes God has to help me along with this boot. You understand? Because I'm, I'm, that's just how I am. That's my nature. And uh, he kept, he was dealing with us to go on TV, to go on VTN this many, many, many years ago, hundreds of programs ago. And, and uh, the contract was on my wife's desk, and I don't even remember the exact amount that it was going to require to go to go on television and uh and and one day i was walking by her office and i saw that contract and the lord said the lord said this to me he said uh, how long are you going to hold off doing that well you know my lightning fast mind was well lord we need the money and the lord said if i'm asking you to do it don't you think i intend to take care of it well what do you say to that well if you're smart nothing so I just walked in, signed the contract, and told my wife, we might as well get this in the mail. Amen. Amen. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember it like it was yesterday. We sent the contract off with nothing in the physical bank account to pay for that, but we had a period of time, a grace period, and a lady came to the church, a little Filipino lady, and, and she came to the church. My wife was there uh, by herself. I, I was uh, downtown. My wife was there by herself. And this little Filipino lady came to the church. She loved our church, but her husband didn't like our church. And so he wouldn't let her come to the church, but she liked our church. And she came, and, and, and my wife sent me a picture. And you say, what was it a picture of? Stacks of $100 bills laid across the desk. And the lady came and said she wanted to support our television ministry. God brought the money out of our account through a little Filipino lady whose husband didn't even like our church. Amen. But, but what if we would have kept acting like we didn't have the money? Hallelujah. Mark 10, verse 29, and, and you know the, 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 the lead up to this. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man. So he's about to tell you that there is no person that can do what he's about to say that won't receive what he said. There is no man that has left house or brother. Now the word left, don't let that throw you. Jesus is talking about giving. He's talking about giving for the sake of the kingdom. And he said, no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or uh, a wife or children or land for my sake and the gospels. Luke says, and the kingdom. But notice, he shall receive. Now this is important. Something I learned almost 30 years ago. Shall is a covenant word. It contains the truthfulness of the speaker. Jesus said, if you give, you shall receive 
a hundredfold now in this time. Is that what he said? How is this? Only, left, only, only gave one house. You know what he said? There is no man that will give house, house, house. But now when he's talking about the return, he says, how's this? Is that right? Yes. And brothers and sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Now, what's the point here? you got to live that way. Yeah. I've given. There's at least a hundredfold in my account. That I can access now. See, people get mixed up because they say, have you ever received a hundredfold on an offering you gave? And, and what they're trying to do is, is trying to pinpoint something. I know I've received a hundredfold. I've received a hundredfold more than once. I know I have because I've seen it. But here's the point. He's not necessarily talking about something that you get. Uh, uh, understand what I mean? That you're going to sow $10. And when you go home, somebody's going to give you a hundredfold. He says that hundredfold goes into your account. And you have access to it right now. It's better to have longevity financially than to live from miracle to miracle. Oh, hallelujah. And we're believing for big things. Big things for you, big things for the ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. A place of high exposure. Amen. That's what he said to us about the place that he's bringing in. You begin to prepare your giving. He said uh, the place that he had for us would be a place of renown, a place of high exposure. I wrote that on my, my vision board, if that's what you want to call it. 2021, a place of high exposure. Amen. And it'll be a place that'll draw people to it, where families will be strengthened, marriages will be rescued. Children from infancy stage all the way up through young adult years can have their needs ministered to by the Spirit of God. And you'll look around and say, my, 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 the abundance has arrived. uh -huh. But remember, he said, I say to you tonight, it began when you were in 10, 500 Markham. Folks, listen, we're a rich church here. We were rich in the La Quinta. And we're rich here. Just compare this to the La Quinta. Look how much we've prospered. And now where we're going is multiplied thousands of times better than this. He said, it began when you were in the La Quinta and you released your faith and you said the day will come, you'll be in a place of high exposure. Get ready, he said, for this is the time and this is the season and it will surely come to pass quickly. Amen. Whew, a palace. A palace. A palace. For the Lord Jesus. Amen. 